Well, hello everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you all to this final Parkinson's Academy webinar of 2023. My name is Diga Hastis and I'm the head of the Parkinson's Academy and the chair for this afternoon. And well, what a way to finish the webinar series. We have the team from NHS Ayrshire and Arran talking about their a multi award winning approach that has improved the timely administration of Parkinson's medication for the inpatient. So, without any further delay, let me hand you over to Nick to start this afternoon's session. Nick, over to you. Thank you, Daiga. Uh, it's an honour to be here because uh, I actually attended the Advanced Master class uh, number 42, and this was a huge catalyst for us to share our work, uh, which we have done uh, over the last year, year and a bit, and it has grown arms and legs in a good way. Uh, and as Daiga says, we have won several awards and been finalists in several awards as well. But the purpose of today is to give you a background to our project. Our project is not just one part, it's actually four different phases that we have done over a number of years. I came in post in 2010 and actually was given the task of trying to improve Get It On Time with an NHS Air Sonaran. And at that time we had just started really rolling out electronic prescribing and we still had paper card exits. It was quickly noticed that paper card exes, although they are good, you can audit them, but unfortunately it's a two hour window. And the NICE guidelines in England, uh, which is what we all have to go by, is timely administration is 30 minutes either way of prescribed time. So I came into post, I was given that, and luckily I was pump primed by Parkinson's UK, which allowed me the time to actually dedicate to this and to learn my, my craft at the time. Uh, but so what have we actually achieved? So what we've done is we've used existing systems within NHS and Aaron. So that includes electronic prescribing, or we'll pro probably call it HEPMA or WellSky during this presentation, because we have had multiple different versions of it during the time. But we've also got a whiteboard, so an electronic whiteboard, a computer system that we're lucky enough to have. But we also have the patient management system like everybody has. And we actually developed a series of forums online to actually get those systems to talk to each other. So what were the difficulties we actually identified? Much like anyone else, it's a difficulty in obtaining accurate audit, audits of medications administration timings and how timely they are. That's not just for Parkinson's, that can be for multiple medications. But the Parkinson's service were also not regularly informed of our patients being admitted. So there was no automatic way of doing that. People wouldn't pick up the phone because people in the wards are very busy. And specialist nurses are not always the priority, and nor should we be. We should be eventually informed, but unfortunately, even patients or their relatives didn't think that was a priority because they were dealing with other things. But staff difficulty in identifying when Parkinson's medications were due to be administered was also a big issue. People said, well, why not put an alert on the computer? But you'd actually have to be at the computer. So that was a big barrier as well. But also, we are constantly asked for latest figures. And I actually did this. So before I even discovered who Richard Cottrell was, who is my other partner in crime in this uh, project, I did this by mental arithmetic for four years. So I picked one patient, in one ward, I printed out their map, which is every administration of every medicine in that month. I picked one levodopa-based medicine, so cobenodopa, or cocarodopa, or stanek, and I worked out every single dose by mental arithmetic for that patient so that I could show my pilot ward how good they were in that particular month. So that was four years until I was actually introduced to Richard by Alison, who's sitting beside me, and within 24 hours, Richard had given me an audit of every single administration of every Parkinson's drug given since the electronic prescribing happened. So that was up to eight years worth of data in one day, whereas I was doing it by mental arithmetic. So why should Parkinson's medications be given on time? I know I will be talking to a lot of people that understand, but if you look at this slide, which is the slide that everybody seems to use in the UK, the white part of the slide in the middle is actually the therapeutic window. 
So where does your Parkinson's medications have to sit for you to get some sort of control? As you can see, there is fluctuating. Uh, it's up and down when you give medications in a pulsatile form. But dopamine is normally released in a steady state. It may go up and down a little bit when you're doing a lot of activity. But as the condition progresses, it becomes much more beneficial to patients to take their medications as timely as they can, and they will never get it right all of the time. Studies have been done on patients at home that showed that only 30% of people at that time were taking their medications at home correctly. That does not mean that we shouldn't do it in hospital. But patients get away with it for the first few years because there is background dopamine left in their brain. But those cells will continue to die off until you have nothing left and then that's much more important that you take medication at the right time, trying to avoid meals if you can. But that is very difficult for some people, especially the elderly when they don't remember things. But pill timers are good at home, carers, things like that. So what have we actually achieved over the time? We actually have a, an automatic, and if Richard was here, he would be not happy just now because it is not automatic. He wrote everything to get this to work. But in my nursery life, it is automatic for me for the ease of data collection, the auditing and monitoring of daily administrations of medications. It's also the transferability. We are giving this away to any of you that want it who have electronic prescribing. You may not be able to incorporate everything we do, but there are people out there that can help you to implement this in your area. The collaboration. When do you ever get? nurses, pharmacy, digital services in the same room, creating things. But there are three people named on the awards that we have, have won. There are many people out there, Alison, Jim, and lots of staff on the wards, including auxiliaries that are fed back to us over the years. But remember, there's patients and, and relatives as well. We've had multiple meetings over the years to develop this. We This has been running for over 10 years. But if you implement it, we've made all the... The, the errors over the years, we've developed it over the years. So we have four phases. The first phase is the monthly audit. So that's automatic, the first of the month, 7 a.m. in the morning, it is emailed to me and all of the Parkinson's staff. And that audits every administration of Parkinson's medications within the BNF that are administered in every single ward within NHS SNRN, as every ward now has electronic prescribing. The second phase was we didn't know how timely or that our patients were actually in hospital. So the daily report was set up to alert me every morning, 365 days a year, that my patients were in hospital. But as a consequence, as I'm going to talk about, we get a lot more data in that. And then we have the system that is commonly known as the Tulip system. It's really the Parkinson's medication prompts, where we have an icon on the whiteboard. But then we have our latest phase, which is probably the most exciting for those who like data and who, those who want to do audits and who potentially will look at trends. We can audit anything in the last 12 months with a click of a mouse. And if I take you back to, I did this with mental arithmetic, it's one click of a mouse, we can eliminate drugs, we can eliminate wards, lots of different things. So what does phase one actually show us? So Jim has been involved in this as well, and Alison. We, so this is an actual audit that was done in 2019. If you take the bottom one, that was actually my pilot ward who'd moved to that ward because there was getting painted at the time. But we've done a lot of work with them over the years. So if you take it, they were in the morning, they were 88% on time. At lunchtime, 86%. Tea time, 81 And at bedtime, 88%. That's taken a lot of work and a lot of working with the staff to get them to change, but also to get us to support them with the, with the appropriate education. If you go to the top one, though, so that is one ward in a community hospital where a lot of Parkinson's patients will end up. They're primarily elderly patients. They had 93 administrations of medications that month. Only four were given on time. So 4%. So what did we do? We approached the, the ward manager, who was 
very receptive. New ward manager, lots of turnover of staff. And you don't always get that because there's a lot of pressure on people. And her whiteboard was actually in an office. So she didn't have the icon that I will, I will show you in a moment. So at that time, they were 4%. The pilot ward was 88% in the morning. And if we go to this year, the ward is 70.3%. A massive increase in less than four years because they engaged with the service, they took the training, the pill timers that we supplied, but also they were proactive in moving their whiteboard out onto the shop floor where people could see it. And that's every member of staff can see it, not just the nurses, the auxiliaries, the patients, the, the relatives coming in. And my pilot ward is still 84%. We then went on to phase two, which is the daily report. This is an actual daily report that I have anonymized. And as you can see, there is a lot more information than I asked Richard to provide me with. I asked Richard to provide me with the name of the patient and where they were. But because you're pulling all that information off of patient management system and electronic prescribing, there is a facility to give more information. So what it tells me is the previous day's administrations of medication. So it tells me what ward they're in. So Ward 2D, Cross House Hospital in Kilmarnock, the patient's name, their unique Scottish number or UK number, whatever it is. It also tells me what medications they are prescribed. But we can then look at our letters or have what we know of the patients to say, is that what I would normally expect them to be on? But it also tells me how timely the medications were given. So as you can see, they're all prescribed for 8, 12, 4 and 8, dispersible Madapar in the morning. All of them have been given late. So significantly late for some people, the 12 o'clock dose the patient was sleeping as well. So when a, a ward would phone us to say, Mr. Smith isn't doing very well, could you come and review him? We would remind them. Could you give the medications more timely and perhaps he will be able to be more mobile? But we have to take it with a pinch of salt as well because this, these patients are coming in acutely unwell with something else as well. But giving medications on time should be a priority in my world, but not for everybody because they are very busy. So that's 365 days a year, seven o'clock in the morning. So I start work at half past eight. So it's already in my inbox for every ward that has administered any Parkinson's medication in the previous 24 hours. We then took it, so, so that was the best, that was the biggest benefit phase two for the, the nurses. This has been the biggest benefit for the nurses and the patients on the ward. So again, this is an actual whiteboard. So this is on a 55 inch screen. So it's a television with the person's name. But as you can see beside a patient in room three and a patient in room four, there is an icon of a tulip. The tulip is the old Parkinson's Disease Society. Now, I did not ask digital services to do that. They must have found that by themselves. So that tulip always sits in the background. When you come through a and &E and you hit CAU or any ward and you're prescribed a Parkinson's medication, no matter whether you have Parkinson's or other conditions, you will automatically have that icon beside your name. So what does it do? It is grey when the, when the medication is not due and will stay grey until 30 minutes before prescribed time. That will then turn green. It will also flash green to tell you that it's changing. It will stay green 30 minutes before until 30 minutes after. So for a one hour window, it will stay green to tell you to give your medications on time. It will then turn to red to tell you you are late with medication. So simply put, it is a pill timer on the whiteboard next to the person's name that changes color. But that involves three different hospital systems talking to each other and actually working. So that's the patient management system, electronic prescribing and the electronic whiteboards. But we then take it to phase four. Now, this is a very busy slide, but this is every administration of every Parkinson's drug in the last year in NHS Asian Aaron. So that's for every ward. You can click on wards. The drop down boxes at the top, you can switch off wards. So you want to audit one single ward. 
So if I take my pilot ward, that is their box. Now, ignore the big red box on the top left-hand side because actually that's just the top of it. Sorry, Daigo, you wanted to ask a question? Oh, your hand's up. That's fine. So the big red part, but if you take the other part, so my pilot ward for that for the last year was 83.64% on time. But we can take it even further. We can analyse every hour of the day. So that tells you that they maybe need a little bit of support around about 7 or 8 in the morning and around about 12 or 1. But overall, they're 88% of the time. But then we go to, have we actually made a difference over the time of, the, of having this project? It started in 2014. It's now went through to 2023. Those figures for 2023 are not quite up to date because that was just the first month of the year. So in 2014, we were actually 41.27% on time. Latest Parkinson's UK audit says that patients say they get their medications on time 42% of the time. So that equates to what people think. But if you see, there is an up uptick there. And even during COVID, we got better, which I, th I thought was quite shocking, actually, in a good way, that we improved during COVID, which is great. So does the data actually show an improvement? So the project started in 2014-15 and is still running. The greatest benefit and the biggest increase has been seen since the TULIP system was introduced on every ward in October 2018. So we, we invited people to ask for it up until that stage, and then we switched it on everywhere without telling people it was coming, because you would then have confused them as to what the icon meant. So over the life of the project, we have increased get it on time or timeiest medications for Parkinson's 33.75%. Because in 2014, we were 41.27. I did the audit for this year, about three months ago, and it was 75.02%. But as I said earlier, we can switch off things using the new dashboard tool. So certain medications are audited all the time. If you have restless legs, they are Parkinson's type medicines. So Adatrol is Pramipexil. Yes. Yeah. Pramipexil, but it's for restless legs. But I couldn't remember which one it was there. Uh, but it's for restless legs. But it will be audited because it sits within the BNF for Parkinson's. So Cabergoline is no longer used in Ersonarin for Parkinson's, but it's used for other conditions. Amantadine, not regularly used for Parkinson's, but used a lot for MS and fatigue. So we can actually switch off those drugs within the audit and we get a more reflective audit, which actually says that we are 76.2% of the time on time. But remember, I did this mental arithmetic. That was never possible before we had the dashboard. So the impact of the TULIP system. Staff use the TULIP system daily. As it's on the ward, whiteboard, beside the person's name, they don't have to ask for that icon to go on that person's name. It automatically appears when they, have, they are prescribed Parkinson's medications on admission to hospital and follows them all the way through every single ward as long as they've still prescribed their Parkinson's medication. But one of our junior doctors very kindly did a quality improvement audit recently because my pilot ward's whiteboard broke for several weeks. So did they get any worse? Was there any, any detrimental effect? So what we found was the four weeks before the whiteboard broke, they were 82.57%. And in four weeks, they dropped to 72.83%. But some people would say, well, that, that's not good. To, in my eyes, that's very good because they have lost the, one of the biggest things that gives them that visual prompt to do it and they have only dropped 10%. They have not reverted back to the 42%. They have embedded the practice of giving Parkinson's medications on time, but also they went back to using the pill timers, so back to the electronic pill timers that we can supply, and they also printed out when the medications were due and stuck them to the broken TV, and that, that's how they managed to maintain a brilliant amount of uh, get-it-on-time. 
So what's the transferability and collaboration? All that is required to have the main parts of our project is electronic prescribing. NHS Ayers and Aaron will give you the monthly audit, the daily report, and explain how to implement these. If you do not have the, a similar whiteboard system, the alert can be sent to any device on the ward, a ward computer, a tablet, or a mobile phone. It does not have to be an icon. It can be an auditory alert. So you can get a buzzer or something going off that tells you you have Parkinson's medications due. We've collaborated with multiple areas in the UK and continue to get requests. But this can also easily be transferred to other time-critical medications for other medical conditions and hopefully rolled out nationwide. The final thoughts, the beauty of our system is its simplicity. It is not simple, because Richard spent a lot of time making it, but for me, it was simple. I asked the question, we had some meetings, we were proactive in doing it and we dedicated the time to it. It is easily implemented where there's electronic prescribing. It improves outcomes. It is difficult to quantify have people been in hospital less, but the sense of well-being has absolutely been less. Sorry, has been better, sorry. Uh, it can be extended to other medications and conditions. The bottom quote is from the latest Parkinson's UK audit. And this is from a person who said that not getting my medication on time delayed my recovery and left me traumatized. Quite a powerful statement. And none of us set out to do that. So this is myself down at uh, the Parkinson's Masterclass 42 with Peter and Diger, where I won the project and then took it elsewhere. We were finalists in the Nursing Times Awards in London, which was a great honor. But the top photograph is myself and Robert, who works with us uh, down at the Parkinson's Excellence Network Awards, where we won the award for innovation and practice. And then we won the overall excellence award, which is chosen from all of the awards on the night. And for those of you who, who know, that's Jane Asher, uh, who has been with Parkinson's UK for 25 years, I think it is now. And that's Rory Kellen Jones, who was the BBC's te technology uh, person, who is part of the Movers and Shakers podcast online. Uh, so he very kindly presented us with the first award. We will not have questions just now. I shall pass you over to my colleague, Alison, who will speak about the impact on pharmacy. Okay, thank you. One of the first things we looked at, really, all this is meaningless if you don't actually have the drug. Um, so the first thing we did in our acute hospitals, we looked at our stock of the Parkinson's drugs, where we kept it, and simplified it so that no matter what Parkinson's drug the patient was on, they would be able to get something. So, for example, in the emergency covers in our acute hospitals and in our community hospitals, we chose a ward where we kept a list of the drugs. So, for example, we keep the cobenyl dopa capsules, uh, we keep a uh, cocaryl dopa, we keep dispersible preparations, we keep a pramapex, so um, ordinary and controlled release, and same with rapinerol, and we keep retigotine patches, and we keep them at the lowest strength. So, no matter what dose they're on, you know, you just have to multi dose, so they might have to take two or three tablets at once, but it's so people have always got um, something at hand so that they shouldn't miss the dose. Um, one of the other things we have is we have an out of hours medicine finder. Um, so when we are closed, pharmacies closed, uh, before they call out the on-call pharmacist, we look, they, we have a system where we can, part of our electronic prescribing, we can plug in, for example, if you were looking for, uh, say, Pramapexel, you would plug in the drug and the strength you're looking for, and it would come up if that drug has been supplied to any ward within Ayrshire in the last seven days. And then the ward would then, or the person looking for it, would then try that ward to see if they could get that drug for that patient. Um, so it's a very useful way of seeing if the drug has been supplied somewhere within your hospital. Um, and it works very well. And obviously out with that, then we call out the on-call pharmacist. But obviously, we want where is possible to make sure it's a timely administration. So if we can find it elsewhere in the hospital, it's a very quick way of making sure that that's done. Um, one of the other things is a uh, pharmacist, usually, you know, pharmacists cover a certain number of wards or 
a particular area. So every day we have an electronic print um, of that is highlighted like a traffic light system. So it's red, amber, and green. Um, so any patient, any new patient who's been admitted to hospital that hasn't been seen by a pharmacist will be highlighted on this. So patient pharmacists can target their workload and deal with these patients first. Um, also, patients are targeted red if certain of their drugs, if they're on high risk drugs that have not been verified. So they haven't been seen by pharmacists. So any Parkinson's drugs will be highlighted in that patient. So we do all our red patients first. So it's a prioritization tool um, for pharmacists, which is very useful. Um, so we can see straight away. And obviously walking onto the wards, as Nick said, the, the whiteboard, the tulip, so we can identify um, patients straight away. So very quickly, we can look on the system and see if there's an issue with perhaps a drug not being supplied or you know, the drug not being given in time. So it's an opportunity for the pharmacist to do some education um, with the name nurse who's got that team where that patient is. So it's been quite useful. And the other thing I think useful is just as pharmacists as well, just to highlight those patients who very quickly become nil by mouth. So that something's actually being done about it and they don't wait, you know, till two or three days down the line and then the nurse says to you, oh, Mr. Smith's still not taking his medication. And you're thinking, my goodness, that's a Parkinson's patient. And, you know, we need to deal with them quickly. So I think generally the whole education um, from the team approach that we've had here has been useful to make sure these patients who do become ill by mouth are treated straight away. So as soon as the first dose, they're not able to take the alert us and, you know, we deal with it and supply what, what, what's necessary, really. Um, so I think that's the sort of main things from the pharmacy um, point of view and how useful these sort of um, prints that we have day in, day out to try and certainly, I think, within Air Shenan over the last few years, we've certainly been able to target these patients a lot easier and certainly improved um, their timely administration. So thank you very much. We'll hand over to Jim now to talk about the impact on the wards, please. Thanks, guys. Usually they say it's the best to last, but I don't know what's happened in this case. How do you follow your two esteemed colleagues? But I'm delighted, obviously, to talk for my point of view and the nursing point of view on behalf of, obviously, my colleague who can't make it today, uh, who was really the original pilot ward. The reality is that nursing were inundated. And we've had this conversation with Nick and the team before that nurses as a team are asked to change things on a constant daily basis from a million different departments. And how do you actually implement that into practice? Nick will tell you uh, for day one, though, over the last eight years or so, it was full of challenges to start with. However, Nick was one of ours, and we, most of the staff were glad that he got promotion and went into a new role, and somebody that was enthusiastic and dedicated and something that really needed attention to was getting medication right at the right time. And Nick was put in place by on uh, at the right time when that needed to be highlighted. The challenges at the beginning were obviously nurses would probably, his colleagues that he works with would be running away the other direction if he was brutally honest because not another change that came in, no, we're inundated. How more changes can we implement? But luckily for Nick, he was full of a lot of senior nurses and certainly the charge nurses who could see the benefit from it in the long run. And that's our job is to try and how do we bring our colleagues along uh, and support any change into practice? Because it is challenging and it is hard, and that's reality. However, I, I'm not an expert in Parkinson's. I do have Parkinson's patients, but even I get a tulip system. And I think that's been the benefit of this whole thing. Something very simple with all the hard work that's going behind it actually has made a huge difference. Uh, and Nick's obviously shown with his results how much a difference it makes. The reality is we'll never get 100%. Because nothing, we don't we don't have the cap capability and capacity. Sometimes me only have two nurses, and certainly with the range of patients we've got in the frailty, then we could be delivering some like two hundred medications first thing in the morning at seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning. Someone's got a gift. Somebody will get something late, uh, and that's the issue we have. But to achieve it in near, nearly eighty percent in a constant basis, I think it's a remarkable achievement, uh, and I think. 
you know, the work that obviously Nick and Richard and all the race work colleagues have put into it to try and make that system easy for nurses has worked uh, and can be implemented and transferred to other organisations. Nick will say again, a way back, if that education was vital, we needed to give staff uh, the right education, the right tools to try and explain why we were implementing it. And Nick and his team, Paula, et cetera, are very good at doing or uh, organised training throughout the year to all disciplines and newly uh, student nurses and newly qualified nurses, et cetera. So that is an add-on that Nick and I think plays down a wee bit, uh, the fact that well, we do all this extra support as well, which nurses need. Uh, we, we, we're forever learning, things change, Parkinson's medication change, other medication change. So we need to try and keep up the best we can. Uh, and there's always someone there with a question or two that Nick or his team are there to help answer. And certainly, you know, we have close relationship with our pharmacy colleagues, and certainly the systems have improved so much lately that we really are only a phone call away now, and we can speak to each other, which in the past was quite difficult and challenging because we very rarely saw each other. Uh, so now with technology and we're using more things like Teams, and et cetera, we're able to get a lot of this answered very quickly, uh, which has been great. So obviously in an ideal world, the whiteboard works, but again, IT, it breaks down like everything else. Computers crash on a daily basis. So how do we remind nurses? Nick's already been on it. No, we implement then. So we'll stick bits of paper on the whiteboard with the patients. We'll use the pill timers. But what's more important is because the project's been going so long, we have other disciplines and even the housekeepers will kind of give you a wee nod to say, do some slashing in the board if it's working. And then we realise, oops, haven't given the medication, it must be there. So at least we've got a warning and that's probably the, the advantage of the whole system. It's a warning for us, uh, an alert to let us get there. And we try to do it timelessly, but if we ever get it 100%, no, we won't. And that's reality. And I think everybody accepts that. But anything in uh, nursing-wise, if we get anything 80% above and keep that at a constant base uh, consistently, I think that's a remarkable achievement. And I think that's been the benefit of the whole of the work uh, that's been involved. And Nick and his team and Richard and all them have obviously rode in the crest of the way for their hard work over the last decade. Because you no know, success does to come into the health service. Change takes about a decade. And us that are old enough and the old dinosaurs that are still here, we see this developing through time. And you no, know, obviously when Nick first came in, he was young and enthusiastic like we all used to be. And Nick, Nick would sort of uh, Nick would Nick would uh, obviously look at figures and see it from one point of view, and myself would see it from another point of view. So we would have nice uh, professional discussions to say, yeah, might only be twenty percent, Nick, but what about the other eighty percent? So let's let's get this into a wee bit of reality. But that's what's good when you have a good rapport with your colleagues, uh, and that's how it's something that can easily be rolled out. That mutual respect. And sometimes an older head or a, a, a different viewpoint from something gives a wee bit clearer angle. So Nick was able to, with some of the discussion we had many years ago, focus very quickly on what he really needed to work on and he actually improved on that because of that. And that gained the trust of his colleagues in the wards uh, and they actually started to welcome him in and they were actually saying, I know Nick, I've, I'm a bit late, but here's the reason. So he wouldn't even need to ask them or say to them, that became norm practice for them. So it's a great idea. It's been well implemented in Air Shadarn. It's something that we certainly as nurses would support. It's some one of the simplest ideas that we've been able to embed into practice out of all the ideas that come to us. And most importantly, it's taking the colleagues with them. So it's not been disrespectful. Actually, Rick and his team engaged the staff and that's the biggest challenge in any change in culture in the hospital. If you don't bring the staff with you, you'll get resistance. And if you get resistance, you won't implement change. So it's a huge congratulations to the Kidney's team uh, that engaged the staff full on and they took the bumps and bruises as they went along. But we got there in the end. And I think that kind of summarised it from a reality and practical point of view from how we implement it within the board in a day-to-day -day practice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Jim, I'll just pick up on one thing you said there about the training. Most of the training that we do, yes, we do our education day. We did one last week with uh, 70-odd staff for the whole day. But most of the training is done by people like Alison and, and yourself. It's that indirect training when someone just asks a question. When we go on the ward, I, I've walked onto wards in the hospital and, and I've got nurses shouting down the ward saying, Nick, my tulips are okay. <laughs> and I have no idea who the nurse is. But it's absolutely brilliant, and it gets that rapport going. And just that simple thing of explaining why Mr. Smith needs his meds. Your workload is easier if you give the meds on time. We used to talk about the benefits to patients, and of course there's benefits to patients, but there are big benefits to the staff. One person can walk him to the toilet rather than two, or he can walk himself to the toilet if you give them as close to time as possible. But there are other things going on. There are infections going on. There are lots of things going on with that patient. And just getting meds on time will not always make them better. Yeah. And, that, and that's it. Like, obviously, we strive to get medications and all medications in time to all our patients. Uh, and the benefits there is that, you, yeah, you hopefully you get them to their ultimate at that time while they're in the hospital so that they can achieve and hopefully improve so they can get them home, hopefully, if that's the case. Uh, but yeah, no, a wee bit what you were saying there as well. There's the fact that the nurses are willingly now shouting along the corner because it's such a good timer for them. A reminder that they'll oh, I forgot the tulip came in, and and that's that's great. Whereas I don't see it as a negative thing. They're actually seeing it as a reminder and a helpful reminder. And for nurses, that's a huge thing if we get a, a helpful reminder rather than getting told no, you forgot them. What 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 were you doing basically? when you, you were delayed for five minutes. So it's great, yeah. Nick, you've got a question. Um, did you objectively look at the symptomatic difference that this has made to the patients whilst they're in hospital? Unfortunately not, uh, because we have a limited team. Uh, I would love to do a lot more work. There's so much data sitting in the background that could be used for projects lots of things retrospectively looking at non-administration everything but unfortunately we don't have a big enough team to actually run that in our research team as well we are in a smaller area if it had been somewhere like glasgow or newcastle or birmingham or london then there are bigger research teams that could absolutely look into that anecdotally have patients told me jim has a patient on the ward that is critically gets his meds on time or his tremor or his anxiety will go through the roof. And absolutely, we can see that in patients. Uh, but no, to, to, simply to answer that part of it, no, we haven't objected. We can't say that the person got out of hospital earlier because of the system. Okay, but it's something that could be looked at. Absolutely. If you, if you, if you had more bums and seats to help you to do that. Okay, um, Oliver um, in Wales has said they don't have electronic prescribing but would such a project be feasible if electronic prescribing hasn't been rolled out? So other ways of doing it. I think you touched, Nick and James, you both um, touched on this. So um, what do you think? So you do require electronic prescribing to have the systems, but you need to also get to know electronic prescribing first. So there has to be a period of time for that to bed in, but you also have to have the backup so you might have electronic prescribing, but how, but how much of an electronic prescribing team do you have in the background? We were lucky. We were the first in Scotland to really roll this out. And our electronic prescribing team is about seven or eight people that run that system all the time. There's 300 reports run daily in NHS NHS and Aaron for different medications. So sorry, Nick. Um, I think... What I'm really looking for is, can he do something similar without electronic prescribing? So let's move electronic prescribing to one side and think about the process that was used. But if you haven't got electronic prescribing, is there another way that you can do that? Sorry, to interrupt. Absolutely. So, so we started off with pill timers. Yeah. So simple pill timers it is absolutely the thing. Because, again, Jim has had to go back to that at the moment because his whiteboard is broken as well. So that's simple pill timers, but you have to be on the ward, do on the ward training. And the so that that training that you can do at lunchtime, you're not going to get the nurses off the wards. You're absolutely not going to get them off the wards. So we have to go to them to give that training. 
And the pill timers are, are brilliant. The, the alarm label different pill timers for different patients is what the, what the wards have to go back to when the board's knacker as well. I think the Thank other important Jim, thing... Thank you, Jim. Any, oh, sorry. Carry on. I just going to say very much the nurses to be aware of what patients, you know, are Parkinson's patients. And if they're, you know, if they're using drugs that are administered at, say, half three, half 11 times out with their normal trolley times, that that's highlighted in their handover from one shift to another. Because I think that's the way back at the beginning, that's what we started, trying to highlight these patients that are needing medications out with your normal trolley times. And that helps them to get the medication time as well, just to go from shift to shift so that they're all aware that these are the type of patients that don't just wait till, you know, the trolley comes out for the usual administration time. Jim, any, anything to add? Yeah, yeah, basically, Ken, yeah, I can understand. Yeah, pill, the pill bottle uh, timers, that will work, but to give it credibility and longevity, you actually need the electronic prescribing system behind it to to be able to give it that meat in the bones, basically. If you didn't have that, it'd be, it would just become a, a timer uh, with no real function. Brilliant. Okay. Moira's asking, um, do you have self-administration policies in place? Uh, oh, Nick, I, Nick's laughing and shaking his head. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I would love it. Uh, my, the self-administration that happens with my patients is the patients hide their medications when they go into hospital and take it themselves. Uh, so I've had that with a few patients, but no, we have no, all the, the the lockers that were in the side of, or the boxes that were inside the lockers were taken away a number of years ago. There's a huge risk perceived with other people in the room and people taking medications, but unfortunately we do not have a self-administration. It is allowed sometimes mm -hmm. for people that are not cognitively challenged, uh, that may be in for day surgery, things like that, so quick in and out. But if they have, have come in with other conditions and infections, then there is a risk to them of taking the wrong medications as well. Yeah. If they're acutely the, unwell. Yeah, the problem we have as well with that is the fact because we're under so much pressure for beds, patients are constantly moved. So with self-administration, drugs would be, be left with the wrong patients. Uh, that's why we kind of stopped it a number of years ago because we were having that problem then as well. Uh, it's just a sheer volume of moving patients from one bed to another or one ward to another and staff forget to move beds. And uh, It would be great if we could get self-medication again. It would be lovely, but I doubt if we ever could get it you know, that, that way that it would be effective and safe. One of the things I think that's made a big difference is if it's a planned pre-operation, you know, an operation, then the pharmacist at the pre-op clinic addresses that with them to make sure the regime is properly prescribed to see if they will be capable of self-medication. And where we can, we would, but it is very much an individual basis. I think a lot of the work as well that was done through the pre-op, you know, identifies these patients. So it's all organised. The drugs are all prescribed on the system for them before they come in. Yeah, well, so. we, we had that recently with a patient. And I said, there's a video that hopefully will go up along with this talk online where the patient was was quite scared of coming into hospital because he was listening to other people in the local group who'd had the horror stories things like that over the years and actually he had that pre-assessment with the pharmacist where they talked about lots of things but the pharmacist actually told them well you do not know about the whiteboard do you not know that we have the icon on the board do you not know that that changes color to let us know when your medications are due please bring your own medications with you give me a note of them just now and that list was already on the system, sitting in the background, waiting for that person coming into hospital. So that's, again, the event. And a, and a paper card that would be the same. So it's just a, about having that conversation with someone to begin with and putting them at ease. And then he can report back to the local group and say, look, did you know this is in place if you actually asked for it? Brilliant. Um, Judy asks, which electronic prescribing system do you use? Over to Alison. So it's Well Sky. <laughs> well Sky is the one that we currently use. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, Ali, I think, is just making a comment that there are electronic devices like the iPhone. Um, once it's programmed, can be used yeah. as an alert for a Absolutely. patient's so, so, origin. Well, I, an iPhone, when you put it in silent, will alarm, it will not ring. So we had a lot of challenges around phones because I know there's senior managers don't like them in pockets. 
But actually, when I did a lot of training, we had a number of complaints came in and I was asked to do a lot of training over the years. Uh, and eventually some of the, the, the clinical nurse managers and ward managers realised that it is a challenge to get nurses not to have their, their phone in their pocket, but it is a brilliant tool if used appropriately and not on Facebook. So I had a patient recently who went into one of the mental health wards. Now, they do not have the same whiteboard system. So within an hour, the sheet of paper was printed, stuck up in red of all of his times. They had phoned me because it was an acute admission. I knew the man was coming in. I delivered a couple of pill timers, so they had a backup. But they put it on their S-bar in the morning, in bold, what's the times. They also gave him the second timer. So he had it beside him. They had one in the office. So the iPhones are brilliant if you use them appropriately because they are not always used appropriately. I see Jim nodding there. Yeah, I think that's the problem. It's the it's social media and things. No, can you trust everybody to do it? We do encourage some of the patients if they have Parsons get their own phone to, to use, kind of we set up wee timers themselves if they can. But yeah, it's difficult. It's a challenge. I mean, yeah, we don't use technology probably to its full capacity. However, there's so much legal things that go on nowadays with things that it's discouraged, unfortunately, at the moment, phones in the wards. But we can see the benefits in them. <laughs> yeah. Um, Roderick's asking, do you have electronic prescribing in your emergency department? We actually do. We don't have it in the very front door. But we have it, there are beds that are longer stay beds within the ED department, uh, which do have electronic prescribing now. But another thing that we just got last week is that at our outpatient clinic, we can now log on to electronic prescribing, prescribe an outpatient appointment prescription, which automatically then gets emailed to the GP at five o'clock the following morning. So they then know, so we don't have to email the GP. It's an official prescription within. Now, the GP still prescribes it. But it's, it's a prescription that we email to the GP. But we also, if we feel that person need, needs to get their medication that day and we're in a major hospital, we can do an, a prescription straight to pharmacy so the person can go upstairs and get their medication that day. It is also automatically email to the GP the following day for them to do the continuing prescription for that. So that's another thing that Richard has designed within electronic prescribing. Yeah. And um, we've got Leah Baker, she's got two things. First thing is she's left her email address. Leah, I've, I've taken that um, and I will cross it on to Nick and you can have your conversation about dashboards yes. and lovely stuff that you need. Um, she's also talking about phones again, about the use of personal phones for the patient, because her worry is that you know, you've got multiple patients on the ward, there's multiple timers going off, Jim's nodding his head, going off all over the place, and there must be an easier way of doing this. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, again, no, the, it's what drugs say. To every patient, all the medications important to them that they get it in time, so where do you draw the line? Uh, Parkinson drugs are, are probably a wee bit more particularly important because we've got other things that we use, though obviously... Uh, a lot of patients I have know maybe kind of palliative end of life, etc. So we have the the infusion devices that we check every hour and things like that to remind us to go and check, make sure everything's running through. It's yeah, it's you know, where do you draw the line for phones? You no, know, we try and limit those things. Uh, and really the only ones that patients really do use their phones for the moment if and it's the odd one is for their Parkinson's. We don't encourage it for anything else. Uh, because usually nurses are on ball and we know when medications are due uh, and the electronic prescription system now is easier for us to read and understand. So you get into a habit if you, if you know your patient. Uh, you know, we've got a couple of Parkinson's patients at the moment in my ward and we've had them for so long, we know exactly when these medications due, though it's still nice to have the tulip to remind us because sometimes we're extremely busy and we're doing other things because things happen in a ward, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, Ali, Ali Asa has yeah, a... Just, just one little thing. Mm -hmm. When the whiteboard broke in, in the, the pilot ward, they had five Parkinson's patients. We're lucky we get donated money, we buy the pill timers, we supplied five pill timers. 
and they put little stickies on the back of every one at the nursing station. So when it went off, they picked it up and they turned it over, and that was the patient's. That sticky would come off when the patient was discharged. Well, that's a very good point. So excellent. So Ali Astor has a, a Christmas wish. Wouldn't it be excellent if all the different trusts in the UK used the same IT systems programmes and also the same in primary care? Oh, Ali, if only. That would be marvellous, wouldn't it? Um, let, let's see what Santa may bring us, say. Um, Leah's back. Um, she's um, asking a question. Has there been any collaborative work with GP in primary care of identifying patients um, who have PD um, and then kind of like working that tulip across from primary care into secondary care and back again? So thank you very much, Leah, because actually Cornwall won, they were in the same category at the Parkinson's Excellence Network Awards. Uh, they were the, the people who were the run-up in the award, and they did a lot of, at the moment, identifying people in community. So they have already contacted me to try and see how we can collaborate on that. So absolutely. So watch this space and see what will happen in the future. Uh, but yeah, there is amazing work going on all through throughout the UK on trying to identify people both in community and in hospital and in, in ED that don't have electronic prescribing as well. But yes, I'm hoping to collaborate with Cornwall uh, soon on their stuff that they've been doing. Brilliant. Um, I'm not quite sure what this question is. Somebody who's anonymised has asked about have any tests been done with wristbands? Uh, maybe maybe they mean know how before we would have uh, the alerts, the bracelet alerts for the patients where maybe they rode certain medication or they were a high risk. But they really, because a lot of times the patients would take them off. So they be, it became a kind of pointless exercise with the wristband. No, like, maybe they're thinking, could you put like a yellow band to remind the staff that patients Parkinson, for example? I don't know if that's what they were trying to maybe suggest with the question. Yeah, that, makes, right, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah sorry, we, Nick. We have done that with stickers, yeah. with clocks, all of that stuff. There is a lovely whiteboard that's written behind the patient's uh, bed, but we are very restricted in what we're allowed to put on that because of, you can identify people's conditions, things like that. But we have used the Parkinson's UK yeah. stickers over the years uh, to highlight on the, the, the old whiteboards, but then the cleaners got very antsy about the fact they couldn't take them back off. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yes, we have tried lots. And also, if you're not on electronic prescribing and using the paper cardexes, then we used to use the yellow data and time stickers at the top of the cardex as well, just to highlight that there was drugs there that needed to be given timely. Brilliant. OK, so um, we've got seven minutes left and I've got this burning question. This has been going for a decade, more or less, it's been said. Is there something... Which, is there something in your head that you think, oh my God, what was the worst thing about starting this project? What, you know, if I went back and started it again, would I? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, the worst thing, and again, I've been asked similar questions over the last few months, and it, it quickly came to me, the worst thing was switching it on in the first place. Because Parkinson's UK said, at that time, I think it was 50% of medications were given wrongly in hospital. That could be wrong medicine, that could be timely, whatever. And we originally had this project set at 15 minutes either way of prescribed time. So not that hour window, that half hour window. And we turned it on, and Jim mentioned it earlier, the 20%. We were less, that we were 18% on time at that point. So when we changed it to the half hour window, which is the nice guidelines, we were still less than that 50%. So part of you says, I don't want to know this. But we were lucky that we did persist with it. And Jim was correct. One of the biggest barriers to change at the time was probably my approach. I was junior. I was a junior nurse when I got this post. But we're all, we all bang that drum. We all want people to change. But I didn't necessarily take people with me. And I have changed my attitude a lot over the years. And it's, how can I support you to do things better? How can I support you to, to give the medications? Can I explain that if you give them your jobs easier or the patient wouldn't be, wouldn't be screaming out in pain or wouldn't be able to not get up and go to the toilet? So my approach has changed. And probably switching it on and seeing how bad we were, we're no different to anyone else. Because the other, another area of Scotland switched it on and 
But yeah, so one of the biggest barriers was switching on and, and realising that actually we're no worse than other people and how can we change that? Uh, but also changing the way we speak to people as well and, and trying to put that arm around people rather than necessarily pointing out their failings is what we would say, but it's not. It's, it's the fact they don't understand the condition. They don't, but they're also under pressure. Our, our pilot ward, when, when that 88% was done, had four cohort rooms and a one-to-one. And that's a lot of pressure on that staff. And Jim's been through this himself. But they're not going to get it right all the time, but they will get it right most of the time. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Um, Alison, how would you encourage your colleagues across the UK, so pharmacy, to get involved in things like this? Do you think it, it's worthwhile doing and, and it should happen? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think we do see the difference, knowing these patients, the difference it makes to them to get their medication on time. And I think we just have to look at the whole system, you know, like before they come into hospital, like, you know, tackle pre-op clinics where there's involvement, where they're asked about their medication. So we highlight early on, if there's a particular issue in primary care, we suggest that the actual times are written. So it's not just four times a day for their co and dopa, you know, it actually says, you know, half seven, half 11, so that that's actually on. So we know exactly the regime that that individual patient and just getting to know the patient and part of the medicine's reconciliation, just, you know, as a pharmacist, if we're doing the medicine's reconciliation process, make sure that we, we're aware that these are the drugs. But yeah, I think generally all our pharmacists are now a lot more aware of Parkinson's and the importance Brilliant. it does make. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, Lee is back. <laughs> what amount of training is delivered to staff? And is it all staff? nursing medical or nursing medical and pharmacy only no it's, it's everybody so we deliver two full day training sessions every year so that's from half from nine o'clock in the morning to half past four with multiple disciplines so we have an overview we have me practical medication advice we have mental health people involved we have speech and language we have physiotherapy but it's a lot of practical sessions we break people up into small rooms and do scenarios with them so that is an NHS day and a community day. So home care, uh, nursing homes, but we also regularly, and Jim does it uh, for other things, but we get involved with the junior doctors. So we do junior doctor training. We get new junior doctors every few months. So we will absolutely, so the consultant will do the, the pharmacology stuff of PD. We will do the practical side of it and we'll spend an hour on that. But we also go to the wards. So we have to go to the ward. If a ward manager is asking us to do training, I will go to other hospitals. We will organise afternoons where I will be there and we'll, we'll maybe get three or four people a session over three sessions in an afternoon. If people are struggling, if particular wards are identified as having more of an issue with get it on time for whatever, then we are happy to engage with anyone. But it's, education can't be one thing. It has to be what's required not just actually what we think. So delivering those whole days are great. I get 100 people at, at every one of them nearly, but it doesn't mean I can get nurses off the wards. So I have to actually go to them. So we get a lot of OTs and physios at those training as well. Yeah, and, and I think it came in touch because obviously I've got, Nick will tell you, Dallas, and I've got a passion for education and development. And what we do, I kind of see where the question's going. A lot of time we exclude a lot of our workers, like housekeepers who are dealing with our patients 24 seven almost. And what we forget is just because they're housekeepers and porters, they're there for a reason. Though uh, a lot of these people are very intelligent and they live with Parkinson's for example, and we exclude them for a lot of things and we shouldn't because we can learn a lot from some of the housekeepers uh, because they live with the diseases that we actually treat but we dismiss them because they're wearing the wrong colour of uniform. And we have been trying to, over the years, break those kind of boundaries down when we do education within our hospital especially. And I think it's something nationally that they need to start looking at. It should Training should be multidisciplinary and multi-purpose for all because everybody has to live with these conditions. Somebody somewhere is treating somebody or living with it. And it doesn't matter what grade they are or what job they're doing. And we need to start including them when we do the education development. Absolutely. Well, we Jim, you've, you've, 
you've got a, um, a fan here, Moira Whitlock, who's just <laughs> totally and utterly agreed with every single word that you've said. And she's also in the process of developing a link nurse role in all the wards. So, so far, so good. Guys, we're at 401. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, Ali Asa said it on behalf of all of us. Thanks for an excellent session. Well done. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, the three of you. Um, have a great weekend once it, once it arrives. Have a great Christmas, everybody. We at uh, the Parkinson's Academy will be back next year with more webinars. But so far, thank you very much to Nick, to Alison and to James. Have a good evening. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.